Hello, welcome to another week of the Birch Bark House at the Mildred Whipple Library. Last week, you can still listen along to the first couple chapters of Summer or Nieben, where we met the family of Omakaius, our friend, who uh, belongs to an Anishinaabe tribe a long, long time ago. They live on the water. They live on an island. They uh, built their birch bark house and, for their summer home. And then they spent the summer gathering berries and rice and some other supplies because they needed to have their food preserved for the winter. At the end of summer, uh, Omakaya's father returned from his travels. And now it is dagwagging fall for Omakaya's family. Let's read about what happens in fall. Now in the mornings, there was a sharp freshness in the air. Omakaias loved this time of the year and jumped from her blankets eagerly, rolled her sleeping mat and fur blanket, and put them away quickly so that she could help rekindle the outdoor cooking fire. Her crow hopped after her. Though it could fly short distances, its wing hadn't yet healed. Ondeg, the Anishinaabe, or Obijwa, Ojibwa, word for crow, was its name. Nokomis was fond of Andeg. The bird often rode on her shoulder and kept her company as she packed dry fish, repaired nets, wove new mats, and alongside Omakaya's tanned hides they needed now for winter clothing. Jackets, moccasins, mittens, hoods. Omakaya's used the gun barrel flusher, Dede's gift. She didn't like the work any better than she ever had, but Andeg's lively company helped. Andeg even frightened off an owl. And once, perched on the head guard of Baby Newo's cradle board, crack, 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 cracked loudly and repeatedly until Mama came running to find a curious raccoon trying to steal from the bundles of dried fish and venison she was preparing to cache. Andeg quickly became everybody's favorite, but the crow slept only near Omakaius. He fell asleep just at dusk, perching low on a branch she had tied into the side of the ribs of the birch bark house. Dede, that's her father. Dede spent a few warm fall days making repairs on his canoe, and then it was time for him to leave again. He would make one more big trip before the cold rains, and then the harsh snow slashed down. Once he stopped gathering and selling the furs of the other, Anish of the other Anishinaabeg, he would go out on his own trap line. So he gathers furs that other people trapped, and then he goes to his own trap line. For the rest of the late fall and winter, he would be home and gone, home and gone, and each time he returned, Omakaius thought with a sinking stomach, he would be hauling back skins for her to work on. One afternoon, his friends and partners came to visit and make their plans. Albert, La Potra, and Fishtail came walking through the woods. When Angeline and Omakaius saw the men coming, they decided to hide and quickly dived into a heavy stand of bush. Peeking between weedy stalks, they had a good view. Albert was round as a kettle and his big teeth stuck out pleasantly when he grinned. He fancied himself quite a medicine man and wore at his throat a circle of bear claws. Next to him walked the tall and handsome fishtail. 
He had strikingly long, thick, oiled black hair and a hawk-thin face with a proud curl to his lips. He carried his pipe in the cradle of his left arm, close to his heart. It was a fancy pipe, made of a piece of sumac wood, marked with a sweet grave. Bands along the stem were carefully beaded in black and yellow. Fishtail took extremely good care of his pipe, cleaned it often, prayed with it every sunrise. To him, it was a living thing. The bowl was red pipestone in the shape of an otter's head, his clan. Dark blue pony beads hung down a swatch of fringe, and Fishtail touched them carefully and lovingly as he stepped quietly along. Miquam came out along the path to meet his friends, and the men talked and joked before they made themselves comfortable sitting on blankets on the ground. Omakaius saw her father open up his leather pouch of sweet kinnikinnick and asima, or tobacco. Fishtail lit the pipe and the fragrance of burning red willow tobacco hung peacefully in the air. Each man, as he drew in the smoke, wore a look of concentrated and peaceful attention. The pipe passed around the circle twice before any of the men said a word. What they said made Omakaius and Angeline creep closer, listen more carefully. Hidden in the grass and underbrush, they breathed quietly and opened their ears to catch the lower tones of the men's voices. Shimukoman, said Fishtail in a growling tone of indignation. The word meant big knife, and it was used to describe the non-Indian or white people who were traveling in larger numbers than ever to Ojibwa land. And setting down their cabins, forts, barns, gardens, pastures, fences, fur trading posts, churches, and mission schools. La Pointe was becoming more Shimukoman every day, and there was talk of sending the Anishinaabeg to the west. They say we must leave the island, Fishtail went on. No one commented. Curled against itching nettle leaves, Omakaius eased her hand to her leg to scratch. She scratched silently and kept listening. That's right, her father said at last, contempt in his voice. That is what they're saying, the useless ones. Albert Lapotra drew on the pipe and frowned, tamping and adjusting the tobacco burning in the bowl. He drew deep and puffed hard, he was part French, like Day Day, but browner than Fishtail. His eyes were greenish brown. His round, cheerful face beamed. He sighed and, with a faraway look, said that he had a vision. Fishtail and Day Day looked blankly and patiently at him when he said this, for Lapotra was known for recounting visions and dreams that had very little meaning, though they seemed to affect him hugely. Now he looked down sternly, gathering his thoughts. Suddenly he blurted out, I dreamed I had lice. In the brush, Angeline and Omakaius clapped hands over their mouths to stifle their glee. Day Day and Fishtail managed to keep straight faces, but Omakaius was sure she saw the corner of Day Day's mouth twitch. Albert Lapotra sighed. The meaning is unclear, he muttered. Let us find the meaning, said Day Day. His voice was serious, but the girls both knew he was having fun with Lapotra. Was anything else happening in your dream? Lapotra frowned as though overcome with the weight of his vision. Yes, he said. We were planning a dance gathering. Ah, said Father. The meaning now becomes clear. This was a deep dream indeed. What? Lapotra was breathless. From now on, when you dance, Father said, without allowing the trace of a smile, you will dance hard enough to shed your lice. Yes? Lapotra's voice was suspicious, 
but neither Day Day nor Fishtail let on by any sign that Father's interpretation was a joke. Perhaps, said Lapotra, I should tell you my own thoughts. And then, to Angeline and Omakaya's surprise and dismay, he told the other men that he was thinking of taking his family, all ten of his children, his uncles and grandmas and grandpas, to a western post where he had heard government payments were made. Omakaius nudged Angeline. Those children were their friends. To think that they might have to leave. Omakaius nearly cried out, but Angeline poked her to be quiet. All of the Obajwa would be safe on their own land farther west, Albert was saying. No one would bother them. Yes, there were hazards on the way. Dakota war parties, hunger, the threat of winter's dire weather. He'd rather not go. Still, said Jolly Albert, he had moved before when the waves of white people lapped his feet. West, always west, said Day Day, agreeing slowly. We hear the Shimukaman axe ring in the woods, chopping a tree. We should be gone before the tree falls. We have to stop somewhere, someday, Fishtail drew thoughtfully on the pipe, and the fragrant smoke clouded his face. West is where the spirits of the dead walk. If the whites keep chasing us west, we'll end up in the land of the spirits. I have dreamed that's where they want us to go anyway, said Albert. That will please them. They are like greedy children. Nothing will ever please them for long, said Day Day. Although his grandfather had been French, he was raised and considered himself Obijwa and kept the rules of his mother's dotum or clan, the catfish clan, the Awasese. Only in some Shumukman things, his cabin, for instance, and his ability to play and win the white man's game of chess with the traitor, did he take secret pride. Not until they have it all, said Fishtail. All of our lands, our wild rice beds, hunting grounds, fishing streams, gardens. Not even when we are gone and they have the bones of our loved ones will they be pleased. I have thought about this. Fishtail put up his hand and held it there, looked keenly at his friends. Before they were born, before they came into this world, the Shemukoman must have starved as ghosts. They are infinitely hungry. The men smoked with increased intensity, looking deep into the fire as the breeze came up and dusk lowered. Dede was thoughtful, his eyes deep and clouded. Even Lapotra looked serious, the dimples set hard in his cheeks. Watching in the bushes, Omakaius and Angeline waited for them to resume their talking. But that day, mulling over Fishtail's difficult words, perhaps, the men kept their silence. Around the fire, thinking about moving their families. Chapter six, Pinch. Now remember, Pinch is Omakaya's brother. He's the greedy one. Big Pinch got in trouble and Omakaya was glad. Here's how it happened. One day, Mama found a bush of late bearing choke cherries. They were plump and so ripe that they had turned a deep blackish purple color. She picked until her fingers turned red black at the tips. When she returned, bearing her load of berries, Mama's eye lit on Big Pinch. I have a job for you, she said. His eyes got beady and his lip turned out. He pouted at her, but she paid his lowered looks no mind. I'm spreading these berries on the bark sheaves so they will dry, she went on. And then she proceeded to spread out the berries on clean birch bark in the warmest patch of sun she could find. You watch them carefully now, Big Pinch. Keep the birds away. Listen, my son. Mama narrowed her eyes at Pinch so that he would know he was trusted with an important task. 
This is our winter seasoning and food. You'll be glad of them when we are hungry in the little spirit moon. She gave Big Pinch a long, ferny branch to wave and made him sit next to the berries. Then she turned her back and went out to the lake with Grandma to check the fish nets. She took Niwu, the baby, along with her, put him carefully in his cradleboard, petted and kissed him. Angeline and Omakaius were sent to town. They were to sweep out and prepare the family cabin for the winter move. Big Pinch was left alone. It was hard being Big Pinch, harder than his sisters would ever know. They didn't understand how good it felt to fill a stomach that so rarely got full. They didn't realize how good it felt to shove handfuls of berries into his greedy mouth. Pinch looked at the berries. Bored, he shooed away a few small chickadees and egg, that's the crow, sat with him on a low branch, but and egg knew better than to eat the berries. If only, thought Pinch sadly, those berries didn't look so delicious. Mama had found a patch of choke cherries that were much more luscious than most. These were the biggest, fattest berries Pinch had ever seen. It didn't seem as though it would hurt to eat a few. Pinch sneaked one, then a few more, then a handful. And egg cawed three times and seemed to disapprove. Pinch made a face at the bird. The berries tasted as good as they looked, better, richer, blacker, without that mouth-puckering chokecherry taste. He might just have another handful. Well, he thought not long after he finished that bunch, a handful more would not hurt. And then, just to balance the look of the berries, he took more from one side, the other. He spread the berries out, and then the bark looked full again. Pinch waited. The sun blossomed slowly, so slowly, and it took such a long time to dry the berries. Pinch tried to amuse himself, but with nobody there to bother, he was at a loss. And he didn't want to play and flew out of reach. There was nobody to annoy except himself. Another handful, another and another. Pinch rearranged the berries once again. Now there seemed to be plenty of berries on the bark. They were well spaced, it was true, but the bark sheaves looked full. He kept nibbling, spacing, arranging, and rearranging until sleep overcame him and he curled up tight and nodded away. Pinch! It was Mama's voice. She was standing tall over the berries and she wasn't the least bit fooled by Pinch's arrangement of the berries. What happened? Where are the berries I picked, you sleepy boy? Pinch woke, jumped up rubbing his eyes, blinking. It was true. There were very few berries on the bark sheaves. Had he eaten so many? How could he? Big Pinch was horrified, ashamed at himself. Pinch! Mama was using her very angry voice now, and Pinch felt so terrible that his brain raced, and he seized suddenly upon a blaming lie. Ondeg ate them. Bad Ondeg. Pinch pointed up and Sure enough, Ondeg, sitting out of reach on a high branch, certainly looked guilty as he glared down and preened his new growth of feathers. Mama, furious that her work was all for nothing, shook her fist in the air and called out to Ondeg, come on down and eat the rest of them. Ondeg, not understanding, hopped down to nearly within her reach and cocked his head in a friendly way as though to inquire, are you sure? Ah! Mama took Ondeg's friendliness as a sign that he really had eaten the berries. Mama grabbed a stick, shook it hard. Ondeg croaked in alarm. With a shout, she threw back her arm, took sudden aim at the bird, and hurled the stick at Ondeg. Gah! 
Ondeg was hit. Although not seriously hurt, he jumped fearfully from branch to branch and fluttered out of reach, then farther, farther away until he was lost from view. See what you made me do, Mama called, but immediately she sat down, sorry, knowing that the fault lay strictly with herself. I must get the better of myself. I must, I must. She shook her head. How could I? Now her daughter's pet was frightened. And even if he had eaten all of the berries she worked so hard to pick, Mama loved the crow and never meant to scare him. How betrayed by humans the bird must feel, she thought guiltily. And she, here she had trained him to eat from her hand. Now he was frightened off. Do you think that big pinch will get found out? Come back, she called hopefully into the woods. Ombe! But the bird, still crying out in confusion, only fled deeper into the woods. Mama sat down sadly, ashamed of herself. That was how Omakaius found her mother when she returned from her town errand. Mama told what had happened, how Ondeg had eaten the berries Pinch was watching, and how she had gotten angry, frightened Ondeg off, how she was sorry to have done so, and would help Omakaius find the bird. Surely he will come to you, said Mama. Just as she was explaining why it was she had lost her temper and how hard she had worked to find those berries, Big Pinch groaned. What's wrong? Mama asked. Oh, Big Pinch lay down, holding his stomach. It hurts. Oh, it hurts. Oh, Mama bent over the boy, inspecting him. A stomach ache, eh? She was immediately suspicious. Gently but firmly, she took his hands in hers, uncurled them, saw the telltale juice marks of bruised choke cherries that darkened his fingertips, then the pitiful berry-stained smile that sealed his guilt. Pinch, she said, and this time her voice was worse than angry. It was disappointed. You lied. The ghost foot carries off liars in the night. As for your stomach ache, there is no medicine but enduring the consequences of your greed. You'll have to suffer, Pinch. Maybe this will teach you. With that, she and Omakaius left him to Angeline and went off into the woods seeking Ondeg. Not far into the woods, they heard Ondeg's distinctive croak. Croak! 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 There, said Mama, pointing. You go to him, Omakaius. He doesn't trust me, and I don't blame him. She gave Omakaius a crust of bannock bread, a treat, and sent her ahead, although she stayed within sight should Omakaius need her. And something happened, sure enough, that made Mama glad she stayed close, though she couldn't have explained it if she tried. Far ahead, she heard branches cracking and a sound she knew well, a low chuffing. Bears, high in the oak trees, stuffing themselves with acorns. The tubby young bears moved along the thinnest branches. More crashing, now a squeal. One of the bears ventured out too far, curious, and tumbled right out of the tree. It's a baby bear. He picked himself up and stood on his hind legs. His acorn chubby belly stuck out like Lapotra's. Then Mama saw both little bears loping and bounding through the woods toward Omakaius. Daughter, she shouted. Bears are shy and these wouldn't seek Omakaius out to attack, surely. On the other hand, they could be dangerous, especially if wounded or angered. Mama ran toward Omakaius, but then stopped, afraid to disturb what took place. The two young bears bounded curiously toward her daughter. She saw Omakaius turn sharply to the bears, and then, after a moment of surprise, Omakaius greeted the animals. 
She stood quietly before them and she was smiling. Mama was further surprised and frightened when, without a sound of warning, a huge sow bear, fattened for winter, rambled out of the brush and passed Omakaius without acknowledging her, a human, as the least bit strange or out of place. And the younger bears, was she talking to them? Mama couldn't see. She crept nearer and listened to what her daughter said. Ani Neshame, she said to the nearest one. You've gotten fat. She smiled at their bumbling, chubby bodies. They were huge. Over the summer, they had grown until they outweighed her by a great deal, though they were still bashful and hung back, just beyond the reach of her fingertips as she spoke to them. So you're getting ready to sleep, she said, offering the bannock pieces. Here, my brothers, sleep well. The bears stood before her, testing the air, the unfamiliar smell of the bannock, and then each one bent to the bit of bread she held, flicked it up with a muscular tongue, and loped off into the woods behind their mother, who was clearly just a little tired of them, following her along and grumpy because she wanted to sleep. Do you remember in summer when Omakaius met that mother bear when she was going to retrieve her mother's scissors from old tallow. And that was a terrifying moment. But now she's seen them again as they get ready for their long winter sleep. In the fall, Omakaya's family is getting ready for winter. I hope that you are having a good winter. We're almost done. Right now, it's foggy outside, but of course, we'll have our winter sunshine and uh, we have a little bit of time to do some things to get ready for the garden. Uh, If you're coming to the library this week, we have some crafts, really fun crafts that I think we mentioned. You can come in and do the uh, crafts here, or you can take them home to do with your family. Read ahead if you want. Some exciting things happen. And next week we'll read about winter.